So we want some transportation answers, right? Well, let's go to the one who probably knows more than anybody about it. Former transportation chief here in Washington State, Doug McDonald. Welcome, Mr. McDonald. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to have a chance to join in, share. You know, it's interesting. I had a friend the other day who said, you know, you keep doing this stuff even though it's a while since you left the Department of Transportation. And I said, yeah, I'm kind of old and stale. And he said, but you're the last person on planet Earth who actually reads government documents. And I thought, well, that's actually kind of true, but it's a sad commentary. So what I do is read stuff. And I don't go out and do a lot of analysis myself. I just try to see what's actually in the documents and then come and talk about it. But you do experience transportation here in the, in the Puget Sound region. So what, what is it? What is the, do you think, is the state of our transportation system right now? The state of our transportation system right now is really in, bad. Um, it's bad on several dimensions. In the first dimension, it's bad because we don't take care of the transportation assets we have, roads. I'm all excited right now about something I do every day, which is walk around the city and the state of the sidewalks. Uh, it's bridges, it's all kinds of things, and, and it's crumbling. And the reason it's crumbling is because we won't undertake the burden of paying to keep it up. So under our feet and under the tires, things are falling apart. That's one bad thing. The second thing is that the way we're experiencing growth is absolutely pushing us beyond what the capacity of our transportation system is. And everybody knows two things. Number one, we don't have a lot of space just to build a lot of new highways if we had the money right. or the will. And number two, even if you build new highways, all that happens is that people decide to drive on them and they fill up again. That is not their purpose. And that's, and that's their purpose up to a point, but at some point it becomes kind of self-defeating because, as people say, and I totally believe, you can't build your way out of congestion, particularly with the growth. So then you ask the question, well, how are we doing uh, on the third dimension, which is thinking of better new ways to deal with the problem? And my own sense is, we're at about a C minus. And a lot of that has to do, frankly, with my own disappointment that the planning process b it brings us a big program like Sound Transit 3, which may do some things well, mm -hmm. utterly ignores other things, and perhaps misses opportunities to plan more creatively in ways that would actually help. We but, really want to get beyond that. But beyond that, I was, I was up this morning, I, I ride in on the rapid ride, and I was up mm -hmm. at Denny and Dexter and Westlake. Uh, and you go there, um, mm -hmm. and you can see transportation working, sort of. Buses, cars backed up, bicycles, enormous numbers of people walking. Um, and, and so people want to go places, and they go, have to go places like that where we have all the new economic activity, but we're not meeting the need. Hmm. When you were the Secretary of Transportation here in Washington State, uh, it was your job to build roads, your job to do this. Uh, so, I mean, the public is probably saying, well, why didn't he fix it? Well, that's... That's a fair question. No, it's not. It's more than a fair question. It's actually a question I think about more than you'd like to know. <laughs> we did do some things, and they mm -hmm. weren't so much my achievements as they were things that the legislature and the public and the and gov two governors and, mm -hmm. and the art department and other people worked on together to get money for some projects. We got a hunk of money in 2003 and more in 2005. And they built a list of projects which were chosen by the legislature, and many of them have turned out to be, first of all, many of them are done, not all of them, and many of them have turned out quite well. Okay. However, nobody in either of those two years, 2003 or 2005, um, said that was anything more than a starter package. And then in 2015, the legislature passed another big budget, and it was very heavy on road building, to, and in my view, too heavy on road building. So. Building roads is good um, sometimes, but uh, the notion of just pouring a lot of concrete and that will somehow save us from this mess of growth and where people want to go is uh, uh, delusional. So we have to do more than that, and we have to do some of that, and we have done some. All right, so we've got Sound Transit 3 coming up, and you've done an extensive study, and, and I heard a radio interview with you, uh, and I learned so much just in that short radio interview. We want to bring more of that here. But before we get to Sound Transit 3, let's talk about Sound Transit 1 and Sound Transit 2. Um, are we done with that? Well, that's a, it's a great question. I came out 
from Boston. I grew up here, but I'd spent quite a lot of time in Boston working on infrastructure projects, and I came out here in 2001 to watch DOT. Sound Transit 1 had already been approved at that point. It was about a $2 billion program to do uh, a bit of a light rail. Mm -hmm. And it, that program is done. And it's done, it was a significant, but not, uh, they underestimated the cost. The, the program cost about three and a half or four billion dollars to finish. That's fine. Then in 2008, we voted for Sound Transit 2. And Sound Transit 2 was a very heavy commitment to light rail and was brought to the voters on the, with a price tag of $18 billion. Mm -hmm. So we went from $2 billion to $18 billion, from Sound one, Transit 1 to Sound Transit 2. That program is half done, and some of the things that are done in it are very exciting to people. For example, people are very excited that Husky Stadium Station is open, and people are excited that Capitol Hill is open, and, and people, so one of the things that's pushing Sound Transit 3 is we love light rail. And people have the experience of some of the Sound Transit 2 programs coming into place. What I think a lot of people don't realize is that in Sound Transit 2, the projects have been approved, mm -hmm. they're in design, and we're paying for them now. The, the bill is in our taxes today, and that goes all the way to Linwood. It goes past um, Roosevelt and, and the station at Brooklyn um, in the University District and up to Northgate. And then it keeps going. And it eventually goes all the way to Linwood. And in the south, it goes all the way to South 272nd. So we have in the program an $18 billion light rail program that does a lot more light rail than you see today. Mm -hmm. In fact, when it's built out, it's about 54 miles of light rail, which is pretty much similar to the system in Portland. And there are only a couple of cities in the United States who uh, have that big a light rail system. Sound Transit 3 says, in some respect, well, let's put some more stuff on the end of that. And so let's go to Tacoma, let's go to Everett. So Very importantly, West Seattle and, and Ballard. But the new price tag, now for this one, comes to the voters not at $2 billion or at $18 billion, but at $54 billion. So with each additional step, we don't get that much more over what we've already got, and we pay a lot more. Yeah, three times more expensive, and we're just kind of getting stuff on the fringes at some point. Well, some of what we're getting is on the fringes, and there's a lot of politics around that, and transportation people will split on whether what the value of all that is. Some of it, I think, is I was asked, if it were dropped in place today, would you think it was a good thing if you could just get on the station today? I think there's a case to be made that some of it would be very valuable. Um, for example, um, from Ballard to South Lake Union. Mm -hmm. On the sidewalks out at South Lake Union, there's, they've stenciled little things that say, future light rail station here, vote yes on Proposition 1. And the only thing it doesn't say is coming in 2035. 2035. Right. So if the, wow. the, the program is, if you're I'll walking be 80 the, years old then. Well, the funny thing is, and we can talk about this more because it's kind of like economics, but Sound Transit has actually produced a calculation for the, the light rail extensions that say, mm -hmm. well, let's know each year how much of the cost we're building up. We're paying for it. And once the program actually starts to deliver some benefits, let's start thinking what those benefits are and we'll build the costs, and we'll build the benefits. When will the benefits catch up with the costs? Yeah. And the answer from Sound Transit, I, this, is, this is not my Excel spreadsheet because I wouldn't even know how to do it. <laughs> the answer from Sound Transit is the benefits will catch up with the costs in 2071. Whoa, so, whoa, whoa, 2071? 2071. I would be 116 years old. You, you, well, I'm not, I'm not gonna make it that far. Well, the really funny, the really odd part about this, I mean, you could look at this in a couple of ways. One is, Let's say you're a millennial voter, and you've got your first job, and you're walking down mm -hmm. Denny mm -hmm. to Westlake, and you think to yourself, I'm going to get a new light rail station, and it's going to be there in 2035, where you're probably either think you made your million, or you moved to the Bay Area, or you decided to do something else, or whatever. But anyway, there'll mm -hmm. be a new light rail station there in 2035. You're still paying, and you've been paying for quite a long time. By the time the benefits of those extensions in an economic model catch up with the costs, you will be retired and on Medicare. 
at no point in your working life will you live at a time when the benefits of this investment, according to Sound Transit, catch up with the costs you pay. Now, that's rather startling. Before we go further, I just want to make sure you're not here as part of anybody's campaign. I'm, I'm very grateful for your saying that because one of the things that bothers me about this entire business is you've got yes people saying a bunch of stuff and you've got no people saying a bunch of stuff. Very infrequently does anybody talk about any of the numbers and actually yeah. say here's what this is actually about. I'd rather give you my sound bite. The consultants have told me what the message is and, and I find that impoverishing. And so one of the reasons I'm not associated with any campaign is I don't want to get caught in that. I want to just find out what Sound Transit says, and if I have a chance to talk to you or somebody else about what I learned, uh, that's all I can contribute. So when you talked about cost and benefits in 2071, that's Sound Transit's numbers. That's Sound Transit's number. Wow. And when you talk about nothing really is going to happen to, uh, to add on, on to Sound Transit 2 in Sound Transit 3 until 2035, that sound transits, what they're yeah, saying. Yeah, and, and, and they have a more complicated answer to that. They have some things called short-term deliverables. Uh -huh. So they've got a little thing here and a little thing there, maybe a new station someplace. But in terms of the extensions that actually build out light rail from the points that will reach under the Sound Transit 2 program, which is 2023, 20, something like that, that stuff doesn't kick in for another decade after that. And so the notion that enthusiasm for light rail translates into vote now, so we know that's coming in two or three decades, it's a long bet. But the notion, will I see more light rail, whether I vote yes or no, the answer is yes, you will, because quite a lot of what Sound Transit 2 already has in the program will be delivered. You, you go actually, today up to Northgate and you can yeah. see it coming. You actually looked at Sound Transit's drawings themselves, and then you made some, some drawings, and we're going to be sure to get those up on the screen, but you showed the difference between Sound Transit 2 and Sound Transit 3, and this is the thing that I find remarkable. We have most of the system already voted for. Already voted for. Already paid for, essentially. And, 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 and most of the ridership benefits that light rail will bring are already in the program that we've approved and we're now paying for. And one of the, I mean, I love numbers, and I, but I hate numbers because, you know, how do people relate to numbers? But I'll give well, you a couple. they, they kind of tell the truth, I'll give they? you a couple numbers yeah. that are pretty simple. Sound Transit is honest in one really important respect, and, and, and honest in lots of ways. These numbers are here. <laughs> the, the, I mean, you can't say Sound Transit won't tell you what it's about. It's just it's not what's in the message. Yeah. So let's roll forward and ask ourselves the question, a lot of people are going to ride light rail in 2040 because there'll be a new system. Mm -hmm. And Sound Transit's calculated the number. And they've put out the number, and I'm sure it's valid, that says there'll be 362 million miles less of people driving around because of Sound Transit 3. Well, that's a big number. Yeah. So then you ask the question, well, just be, tell me, by the way, what's the total? How, how, how big a dent is that going to make in the total? Well, you divide 362, I'm not making this up, this is by 27,900. And so you find when you calculate what 362 million miles really means, it's 1.3% of the miles people will be driving around. So for our $54 billion, we get a 1.3% uh, improvement in our transportation congestion? Well, that's right. If, if, if on that one point three percent is and this is why, fifty-four billion. This is why, if you look at Sound Transit's material, they quite carefully they show you all these pictures. They, the, the 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 article in the Seattle Times says we are choking on traffic gridlock. So it's all about traffic gridlock. We mm -hmm. gotta do something about traffic gridlock. That's great. I couldn't agree more. What does this do? Uh, well, actually, this isn't going to affect congestion. And that's actually in their materials. What it will do is give some people the opportunity to get out of the congestion by being on the rail system. Okay. But it's heavily, heavily uh, subsidized. I think you talked about how it's like $52 per it's ride. It's very heavily subsidized, and, and some people are going to benefit. Now, if, if there were 100 cars, on, 100 cars on the road in 2040, with Sound Transit 3 in place, there will only be 98.7 cars. 
That's the 1.3 oh reduction. Oh my gosh. Okay, now w when you reduce that from 100 to 98.7, you obviously don't make much of a dent in traffic congestion. Right. Some of those people are going to be riding from Everett and they're going to say, because they're going to pay a fare, it's going to be very heavily subsidized. Mm -hmm. That's why the taxes go on. The taxes don't just pay for building the projects. The taxes pay, and, and all transit is subsidized. So this is not a sin. And, and that's okay. All transit has to be subsidized because otherwise nobody could get anywhere. Well, yeah. So that's okay. But the interesting thing is that all the people who are still stuck in their cars are paying all the taxes. So the people who left their 1.3 car out of 100 behind are riding the light rail. Um, so it's a very interesting set of equities, and, and, and there's no simple solution to this. You, you, you can't simply say, well, let's put in a different plan and have it work differently. You have to take the pieces and try to put the pieces together of a puzzle in a mix that makes better sense than that. And the fundamental question about Sound Transit 3 is could we do better? Well, yes, and that was one of the questions that I was going to, to ask. Uh, and, and actually, it's kind of a, something that, that bugs me. Uh, I would ride light rail if I could get to it. Or if, if when I got there, there was a place to put my car because I'm not going to walk in the rain for a couple of miles to get to a light rail station. But there's not any place for me to, to park. It, and it seems to me to be a real simple thing. Uh, in other cities that I go to, there's parking structures around light rail stations. Some places, some places there are, some places there aren't. Now, we obviously aren't gonna put a 1,200 car parking garage in, ca in Capitol Hill, so people right. can drive to Capitol Hill and get on the train and ride downtown. So that's counterproductive. Now, what about putting a big parking garage out in um, Overlake so people can drive there, or, or at Northgate, where there will be some parking? Mm -hmm. But the problem is that the, the more you park and the more you drive to light rail, the further out you build the sprawl. I mean, in a funny sort mm -hmm. of way, now you will have some development. You'll have a lot of development. I mean, this, there well, this will be Well, this happened in Washington, D.C. Sure. I mean, Bethesda used to be a sleepy neighborhood. Right. It's not anymore. And you can see some of that today. Now, you can't see as much of it as people hoped in some of the, uh, some of the, along some of the light rail in Rainier Valley. But that's some where people want to live. They're going to do that if they can. And they can. And that's going to be good, but a lot of people, you know, the notion, <laughs> the problem with all this is that transit has, and all transportation has to work for you. So if you, there are lots of people who are going to find life in Columbia City precisely what they want to do, and there's a lot of other people who want to be in Issaquah. Mm -hmm. And the notion of trying to get a transportation system that works also for some of that, for everybody, is really, really difficult. And, and, and what's also difficult is that where people are traveling and how they travel is also changing. When Sound Transit 3 was, or Sound Transit was invented, there was a lot of talk about the light rail spine, how we'd have a spine from someplace mm -hmm. to some ever to Tacoma, yeah. connecting up these cities. But as development has happened, nobody at that point was thinking about Overlake or Microsoft. Nobody was thinking about Costco being in Issaquah. Nobody was thinking about people who were living in Woodenville and wanted to drive to Tukwila. And so we today, we're much closer to trying to move people around a spider web than we are of just putting people in a pipe. And that spider web, how to make it work so that there's a place for you to go to get what suits your need to go to the place you want to end up involves a lot of different tools. Light rail is clearly one of them. Roads are clearly one of them. In downtown Seattle, one of the things I found in the last few months looking at the data is that uh, walking, people are living on Capitol Hill working in South Lake Union. Walking is the fastest growing way people get around to work in downtown Seattle today, way faster than transit. And transit in downtown Seattle already serves 45% of the people going to work. Interestingly, Sound Transit says, well, if we make the light rail investment, what will that number be in 2040? The number goes from 45% to 52%. Well, wait a minute, that still means in 2040, after we spend the $54 billion, we've still got 48, almost half the people trying to get into Seattle some other way. Have we thought this through? And have we looked at all the tools? And my own feeling is uh, we could do better. 
I've got hours of questions, but I've only got about uh, five minutes to go. So we got to get to that, what you just said. Is there something better out there that doesn't cost $54 billion and is not going to you know, be realistic to us until 2070? Well, my ex I think there's lots of different examples. And I think that what's happening with UberShare or the Microsoft Connector or various other things are important things to look at. Mm -hmm. I'll just tell you my own experience. I mean, everybody's transportation wisdom fundamentally comes from what they do. I ride light rail, I ride it to the airport, I ride it to the university, uh, and I've ridden it back and forth to Capitol Hill. I live on Aurora, I come in on the rapid ride E-line, the red buses. Mm -hmm. The rapid ride lines, the, the one to West Seattle, the one to Ballard, the one on Aurora, and one down on uh, uh, 99, uh, have been about three or four years Five maybe being implemented, and they've been implemented at costs of tens and hundreds of millions of dollars, not billions. Mm. Today, the rapid ride lines carry 67,000 people every day. Link light rail carries 67,000 people every day. So the bus and the light rail carry the same? The same. I'm guessing that the bus probably didn't cost as much. The bus not only did not cost as much, but it didn't take as long to do. And you have to find a place, you gotta move some cars out of the way. We have a bus lane on Aurora, which is mm -hmm. one of the reasons it is so popular. The ridership graphs for the bus, this is a graphic you might like to look at, I'll share it with you in a minute. The bus ridership and the light rail ridership are both surging up. But the bus ridership has done that more cheaply and quickly. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting about the bus ridership, because my wife and I face it every day, we love the service except for one problem. It is so popular that the bus passes by our stop if somebody's not getting off and we and the other people at that stop can't get on. Mm. Now what about now, rather than in 2035, we could build more of that kind of a system and even network it in more interesting and ways. It's not either or. It's not roads or transit, it's not buses or light rail. It's a putting together of the pieces in a way that's cheaper and, and, and quicker. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems with Sound Transit 3 is that there's a lot of special interests in Sound Transit 3 who have a very skewed view of what transportation should be based kind of on what business they're in. Who are those special interests? Those special interests, I, I mean, everybody's a special interest, I'm a special interest, but those special interests are construction companies, engineering firms, consulting firms uh, and uh, you know people that sell the bonds and do that, all of that and the people that build it and of the sound transit financing according to the article in the Seattle Times last week roughly 62 percent of the funding for this yes campaign is coming from people who are our friends and neighbors um, and jobs are a good thing but frankly uh, they are actually a special interest and mm. and all special interests have got to get work together, but citizens have got to become a special interest whose interests are at the table as well as politicians and the stakeholders who are going to build the system. The Seattle Times editorial, um, their editorial was reject this and basically come up with a better plan. Um, you're talking about a better plan in our area. I mean, in addition to being you know, a, a transportation chief, uh, you've also been involved in politics for a while. Do we have the political will here to change this? Well, you've gone now to the heart of the problem, and <laughs> that's a whole other discussion that has to do with who's at the table to make the decisions. And my own bias has been that, and, and this, is not a, this is not a fact. This is a straight up opinion, all right? My own opinion is that too much of the planning power has been with an agency that has a pretty singular view of how this whole thing should work. And that we need a, broad, a, a table that's balanced a little differently. And we certainly need more people at that table who are looking at these kinds of numbers, looking at the performance of the system rather than simply the benefits of building it, mm -hmm. to bring that mix together. Now that is, sounds simple, but it is a huge political problem. Now the problem, the sound transit three people say, well, we got to do this because the future of the region depends on it. We can't stop and replan or rethink this thing mm -hmm. now. But the fact is, if the projects aren't going to start for another 10 years, we do have time, if we have the will, 
to perhaps come up with a better plan. So I do not think that the argument come up with a better plan is simply a dodge I, uh, of wanting to do all the good things that Sound Transit 3 says it does. I think it's a plan to get a plan that will work better for the region over time. Ms. McDonald, we have to get to opportunity cost because we only have three minutes to go. So if I'm spending all of this money, you know, out of my taxpayer's pocket for this, am I, do I have money for anything else? You're going to have to make that decision for yourself, but don't think for a minute there's not going to be an ask on you <laughs> uh, because we have big transportation problems to solve that are on the forthcoming agenda. We really just can't let I-5 fall down. No. Uh, and we have some other big costs of which some people have talked about the education funding issue and the fact that this package goes into the property tax in a way that may make that problem more complicated. The superintendent of public instruction actually came out against Sound Transit 3 recently, which was news to me and an interesting intervention. So uh, we always have opportunity costs. You can do buy the new car or you can do the kitchen. Governments have the same problem that people do. And so the problem I have is when people see that they voted the $54 billion, then people come back and say, well, we need another you know, like $12 billion. Some of those things in that $12 billion package may be very important, urgent, and people may say, I've had it. And so that's a political judgment that, that people will make. And I, don't, I, I know how I feel about it because I have some things I'd like to see first. Uh, but other people, everybody has to make their own judgment. Well, it seems to me and that the three major choke points, if you will, around here from a transportation standpoint are I-5, 167, and 405. Right. And, and, to, and Shouldn't that be where we concentrate our efforts? Well, I, I, I believe that the failure to, to deal in a collaborative way with all the different agencies, the City of Seattle, the state, Sound Transit, the federal government, figuring out I-5, I-5 has to work under any theory of the future. And we are not, it is an orphan. It is not in any of these programs. And I think that's a very telling critique of where we are. Hmm. Um, 15 seconds, uh, where should we go? We should, in my view, ask ourselves with more time to look at the alternatives, what would some of the alternatives look like that aren't in this package? Thank you very much. Doug McDonald, former transportation chief right here in Washington State, telling it like it is. Thanks.